And so it's my pleasure now to sit and listen with all of us to these four stories. They're actually quite different. We're going to start with a great dancer. And rather than introduce each of them, I'll just ask each of them to do maybe one minute at the beginning on sort of how you got where you are. And we're going to go right down the line here from uh, starting with Galen. And actually, you're sitting in a different order than on my paper, but that's fine. And so it'll be followed by Amato, and then Akalina, and then Paul. And each will, um, and we can, yeah, we can applaud them all right now. That'd be great. And again, we'll start with Galen, uh, who started as a dancer, but now I would actually say you're almost as much an organizer as you are a dancer. So, so take it away, Galen. Not on? Let's see. No. Oh, there, you go. there you we know. go. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, the setup is not very good. Everybody will probably have to do this because it get blocked. Um, first of all, so think about questions. Um, and I I'll, will try to keep this to a minute because I know we are running a little behind, but um, I am the chair of a group called Dancers Alliance, which is basically a volunteer group of dancers and choreographers based in LA that works to improve the rates and working conditions for professional dancers and choreographers. And I serve on the board of SAG-AFTRA, which is the entertainers union. Um, and Clyde Kasatsu, who's on the Apollo board here, actually was just elected the first Asian American local board president in LA, which is very exciting, so congrats to Clyde. And I am half Japanese, in case you're wondering. A lot of people don't know what I am. I'm half, half Japanese. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, what I'll be talking on behalf of is something that probably seems really foreign to you. Dancers are not normally considered part of the labor pool. You think we just do what we do, but any entertainer in LA, actors, musicians, models, you don't typically think of us as workers, but we are workers and we deserve the same uh, working conditions and protections that any worker does. We often don't get health care or pension and it's really sad because we can't do what we do after age 35 usually, if you're lucky, usually past age 30. Um, typically. So uh, we have done really unorthodox organizing, um, really reaching out through social media, making campaign videos on YouTube. All of our community is under age 25, 90% of the people are, so we have to go out and figure out what appeals to them. We hold our meetings at clubs. <laughs> we sell tank tops that say, I am Dancers Alliance, and it's about making it feel cool. It's about making it feel like something you want to be a part of, and just using the most non-traditional means outside of the traditional union to get that accomplished. Last year, we had a landmark victory in unionizing music videos. Music videos have existed for 30 years, and for those 30 years, they were non-union, and no benefits were being paid to any of the people that work on music videos. And last year, we won a union contract. And so we are not stopping and taking one second to breathe. This year we are starting to unionize tours. When you go and see an artist performing concert, none of the performers that are performing behind that artist are on a union contract. On Tuesday, just a few days ago, we had the launch event for this campaign to unionize tours and we had over a thousand people there. We, um, on Twitter, we have over 10,000 followers now. On Instagram, which we just started, we have 1,800 followers, and it's just becoming this huge movement. So that's where I will be speaking from, which is a very, very non-traditional place to be speaking from. But uh, thank you guys for having me. I'm very excited to be able to share my story. Good morning, Apollo. Um, Feels good to be back in uh, Las Vegas. Um, I uh, I was asked to to give a. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I was asked to give a a, a minute speech. I, I'm going to uh, take the uh, the liberty to take a few more minutes, President Cohen, if that's okay. Um, Apollo. My name is Malcolm Amato Uno, and I work at APEN, the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. Um, briefly, for the past 20 years, APEN has w been winning 
environmental justice campaigns and building power and leadership in low income and API immigrant and refugee communities in the Bay Area and throughout California. Similar to, to Apollo, for APEN, for the past 20 years, our members have overcome hardships and led fights to end racial discrimination, demand environmental justice, and expand access to economic opportunity. And for the past 20 years, APEN members have persevered through living in communities like Richmond, where the Chevron refinery poisons our family and pollutes the environment. Sisters and brothers, more than simply persevering, APEN is also building power to win. We stopped Chevron, one of the world's biggest polluters, from a billion dollar expansion that would have allowed them to refine heavier, dirtier crude, continuing to point poison frontline communities, including APEN leaders like Lipo Chan Than Asak, who was recently recognized as a community resilience leader by the White House for his deep, deep commitment to make Richmond better. And when Chevron and other big oil players tried to dismantle AB 32, California's signature environmental justice legislation, APEN responded with an unprecedented effort to mobilize API voters to defeat Prop 23 in the polls uh, in 2010. Building off this momentum in 2012, APEN set forward to build a statewide powerhouse of progressive API voters in a state that possessed close to a third of the country's API population. We did this by launching a C4 political organization that, that actually had over 50,000 conversations in English, Cantonese, and Mandarin, and Mandarin, the largest direct voter contact program in the country targeting API voters. We did this by conducting speakers bureau trainings throughout California in partnership with APALA, in partnership with labor uh, councils up and down the state. And we did this by creating the first California API voter guide, which was uh, translated in six different languages, mailed to 100,000 uh, API voters in California, and was supported by 22 organizations throughout the state. Sisters and brothers, we learned vital lessons from the 2012 election. We learned that API voters emerged as a critical component of a growing progressive majority in California. Sisters and brothers, we learned that the API vote in California doubled since 2008 and now represents over 11% of the electorate. I'm gonna repeat that. We learned that in two, from 2008 to 2012, the API vote doubled and now represents 11% of California's electorate. We learned that Proposition 30 passed on the backs of community and labor coalitions to ensure that the wealthy paid their fair share for a better California, generating between six to nine billion dollars for our state. And equally important, we learned that community and labor coalitions defeated Prop 32 to ensure that working families have a voice in our democracy. <laughs> Apollo, we at APEN, we believe that we live our values. We refute the notion that labor movement and the environmental justice organizations cannot f find common ground. Rather, we believe that a strong labor movement is not only good for APEN, but a strong labor movement is good for the broader social justice movement. Our strategic partnership with organized labor during the 2012 election is proof that when we work together, sisters and brothers, we win. <laughs> However, winning in the future will require changes because demography does not equal destiny. We have all heard that APIs, along with Latinos, represent a massive demographic shift in California and throughout the country. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, we caution against the assumption that because our communities, we caution against the communities that, <sighs> Sisters and brothers, we caution against the assumption that our communities will remain to be pro-environment, pro-worker, and willing to invest in vital government services. People of color may, may pull well on certain issues, but values matter. Meaning what people care about, jobs in the economy, being able to breathe the air in their neighborhoods without getting asthma, being able to afford housing, being able to send their kids to a good school in their neighborhood and not having to worry that the refinery next door is going to explode, these values have to be incorporated into our movement vision. Sisters and brothers, direct engagement makes all the difference. We can't assume that this new demographic majority is going to flock to our movement. We need to organize and scale up in an unprecedented effort in a massive way in order to strengthen this demographic as a progressive base. Sisters and brothers, our question is, is this a left mo moment or rather is this a left movement? Thank you so much.
Good morning, Apollo. My name is Aki Lina, or Aki as everyone calls me, Soriana Versosa. I'm the executive director of the Filipino Workers Center in Los Angeles. And we have, thank you. We, uh, um, I actually started as a student organizing uh, my second civil disobedience action was to get arrested with the local 11 Nuatani uh, hotel workers in Los Angeles. Um, and, and one of my mentors and one of the founders of the Filipino Worker Center is uh, John Deloro, my good friend. And just to start us out in his honor, you know how he loved to chant and sing, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've been told, but Apollo is mighty bold. <laughs> now, I don't know what you've been told, but domestic workers are mighty bold. Are we right or wrong? Right we are right. Are we weak or strong? We are strong. Now, I don't know what you've been told, but Apollo is mighty bold. Thank you. I like to channel him. You know him. Now, Filipino Workers Center, this is the Community Labor Alliance. Are we community or are we labor? That may be a question in your mind. Well, we're a little bit of both. We are a worker center. And part, we organize domestic workers, live-in uh, Filipino caregivers, for the most part, in our organization. And part of the question that we are fighting is, is domestic work really work? What do you think? Yes. Hell yes! <laughs> domestic work is work. Are we organizing domestic workers? Hell yes, we're organizing domestic workers. So we are a part of the labor movement. And as, as it was said, as Larry said, this is about a movement, right? And so we are gaining, as we grow our base of domestic workers, um, as we grow as a California Domestic Worker Coalition, and we are fighting for our California Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, as we are growing as a national movement with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, we are now over 40 domestic worker organizations across the country and growing strong. In the 1930s, under the Fair Labor Standard Act, there were two groups of people that were excluded. Do you know who they were? Farm workers. Farm workers and domestic workers. Because the South did not want to shake up the racial hierarchy. So they wanted to actually exclude all African Americans first. And when that wasn't possible, they said, let's do the next best thing. Let's exclude farm workers and domestic workers. And until this day, a lot of those exclusions still exist. On the federal level, uh, caregivers are excluded as companions um, from labor law. So even if someone is paid $4 an hour, it is legal. Even if someone is paid $2 an hour, even if they are not paid at all, it is legal under federal law. And we are organizing and fighting to change that. Yes. In California, uh, domestic workers are now the last group to enjoy overtime protections, meal and rest break protections, because the farm workers have now won overtime in California, which is a great victory. But now domestic workers, we deserve basic protections and that dignity that all workers should have. So we are fighting for overtime protections. We are fighting for meals and rest breaks. And for living workers who are there 24 hours a day and many times um, treated more as servants than workers, we are fighting for uninterrupted hours of sleep so that we can protect our bodies. And also, we are fighting for kitchen access so that we can cook and store our own food. Uh, so these are basic things, but this is a part of a larger movement building strategy. We have this legislative campaign that is bringing our issues 
into uh, the sunlight and out of the shadows, and we are forming a large coalition working together with traditional labor. We started out our drive for dignity on this last Monday up to Sacramento in the House of Labor at the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, and we are working, um, the National Domestic Worker Alliance now has um, a national MOU with the AFL-CIO and Re President Richard Trumka himself has come out to Sacramento to lobby for the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. <laughs> and these alliances make a difference. Um, we are also forming a broad coalition. We have a lot of interfaith um, you know, representatives in our coalition uh, from uh, CLU, Clergy and Labor, Labor United for Economic Justice. We are working with Ben the Ark, a Jewish par partnership for justice. And uh, we have students and we have organizations of employers themselves, domestic worker employers who are coming together in our coalition to fight for these basic rights, to fight for justice. Um, and so we have a unique um, opportunity uh, through this campaign to really build a larger movement, a foundation to make sure that after legislation is passed, that we can actually make it a reality in the homes. Because like with immigration form, you know, even if you get a law, it doesn't mean that it's a reality, right? So how do we lay the foundation? How do we take this as an organizing opportunity to build those partnerships? and to build the long-term vision to really make it happen in our homes, you know, in our communities. With Jewish, um, we are seeing that the interfaith um, community is a really important component to bring together employers and domestic workers to the point where we have rabbis who are facilitating, you know, these coming together workers and employers to sit down and negotiate contracts so that we can actually create situations that are just for uh, workers and meet the needs to have quality care for those who need care in our communities. Thank you very much, Apollo. Good morning, Apollo. My name is Paul Vallon. I'm the second vice president of Apollo San Diego. Hey, San Diego. Over there. I'm also an organizer with United Domestic Workers. Hey, domestic workers. <laughs> Thanks, Joanna and Matt, for hiring me. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm fairly new to union organizing, but I've been involved with a number of campaigns, grassroots community-based campaigns as a member of the Filipino Migrant Center in Southern California, and also the National Alliance for Filipino Concerns, NAFCON. Uh, I've been asked to be part of this panel because of my involvement with a campaign that happened in New Orleans, Louisiana, my hometown. Um, since 2005, actually, let, let me show the video. Thank you, Jason. First, say they were recruited from their homeland with plans of a fat paycheck and a better life. But they say they later found themselves in a far different situation, living in substandard conditions, working far out in the Gulf, and making only a modest wage. Style shipyards use of Filipino workers and recruiting agencies has been criticized for more than a year. It had already attracted the attention of the Embassy of the Philippines, but now in light of last week's disaster, the company is under even more scrutiny. But we need to know more details, their contracts, for example, how were, how were they brought to the U.S.? In November 2011, Grand Isle Shipyard and several recruiting agencies were named as defendants in a class action lawsuit that claims Filipinos were brought to Louisiana and forced to work in inhumane conditions. More than 40 former employees say they were recruited in the Philippines and promised visas. And they said they were told of steady, high paying welding or construction jobs. But when they got here, the Filipino workers said they were essentially imprisoned. Workers reported that at times, six men slept on racks in a 10 foot by 10 foot room. The lawsuit makes numerous other claims deplorable work conditions, uh, not working uh, workers over 300 hours in a month and not paying them any overtime for that, uh, charging workers for uh, housing when the housing was supposed to be free. Employees say the company's CEO made some of them wash his car and work on his home. 
The CEO, Mark Prejant, did not respond to a request for comment. Attorneys for his company, as well as several recruiting companies named in the lawsuit, did not get back to us. In court, these attorneys have called the allegations false and are trying to get the suit tossed out. This case is pending in federal court in New Orleans. Earlier this summer, a group of workers said company officials threatened them with deportation unless they dropped the suit. A federal judge ordered the defendants not to contact those workers. Attorneys say none of the plaintiffs in the suit were involved in the platform fire. They're part of a bigger group, actually, 100. I understand there were 162 uh, scaffolders and, and uh, uh, different types of workers uh, who work in an oil rig uh, who were hired from the Philippines. It remains unclear what kind of training or background these injured workers had. We're also looking to what factors played into this deadly platform explosion. Unbelievable story. Thank you, Brendan. Hmm. All right, so this is the... Oops. <laughs> I wasn't going to sing, but um, as you saw in the video... Uh, I know I'm not an entertainer like these other folks. Um, but as you saw in the video, since 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, there was a need for skilled workers to work on oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. And there have been over 500 guest workers recruited from the Philippines uh, as welders and pipe fitters and other skilled labor. Uh, they, were they were recruited with promises of opportunity to provide a better life for their families with wages of up to $20 per hour. But in November of 2012, you saw there was an explosion on the Black Elk oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico where three Filipino nationals actually died and a number of others were severely injured. This is when um, the working conditions of these guest workers were exposed. Uh, the Philippine consulate, you saw Ambassador Kuisa uh, talking in the news report. He actually didn't meet with any of the workers. He was flown in on a GIS private jet, wined and dined, and he reassured them that he would continue to send Filipino workers to their, um, to their company. So we were calling for his resignation, and we are still calling for that right now. So in February of 2013, community and faith-based organizations from across the country came to New Orleans to join a solidarity and fact-finding mission. We were able to speak with a group of former GIS workers who were able to escape their deplorable working conditions. Some literally had to dig tunnels underneath fences in the middle of the night to get away from their company. We found that these workers were forced to work in slave-like conditions. They were working up to 300 to 400 hours per month, 18 hours per day, often seven days a week. Uh, they were making less than $4 an hour. There was no overtime pay, obviously. Also, they were forced to work months at a time offshore, whereas the local um, oil rig workers were only allowed to work two weeks at a time. Work site safety was non-existent, and they were forced to work through injury and illness. Uh, as you saw in the video, they were forced to stay in tiny rooms, multiple people in a room, uh, even in storage containers that were uh, converted to sleeping quarters. And they were, all, they were being charged rent for this. They were being charged from $1,000 up to $3,000 a month to stay in these quarters. Uh, they were locked into the rooms at night, so they weren't free to leave. They had to be in the room by a certain time, and they were under uh, guarded watch by armed security. They were denied the basic right to practice their faith. So these migrants were brought over by recruiting agencies tied to the Grand Isle shipyard. They were charged enormous amounts of fees and were fraudulently given specialized E2 investors visas, which allowed them to stay longer in this country as guest, than regular guest workers. They were given fake social security numbers and were forced to sign contracts in which their tax returns uh, ended up being stolen by their employer. Their passports were being withheld from them, and they were constantly being threatened with deportation if they started to complain about their working conditions. So if this is not an example of modern-day slavery, I don't know what is. This is not just a labor issue. It's not just an immigration issue. It's also a human rights issue. These workers, like my parents, came here trying to find a way to support their families because their opportunities in the Philippines was limited. Many have not seen their families or children for many years now. It made me mad knowing that this is still happening in the United States, in Louisiana, in 2013. These workers are literally, they are literally, literally my neighbors living a mile away from my house that I grew up in, in New Orleans. Uh, 
They are part of our community, and they needed support to figure out how to seek justice for the crimes that were committed against them and by their, by their greedy employer, the Grand Isle Shipyard. Like many migrants, they didn't know what rights they had. Corporations like GIS are finding new ways to exploit migrant workers to boost their profits, undercut wages. They treat migrants as if they're not worthy of basic human rights that we are all entitled to. They've been enslaving migrants since 2005, and that's way too long. So those, of the, those workers who are lucky enough to have escaped have received T1 visas, which are, is a category for trafficked workers. So their immigration status is no longer tied to their employment with GIS or the Grand Isle Shipyard. Uh, former workers, both in the Philippines and the United States, have had an opportunity to file a class action lawsuit against their former employer. Okay. But we have to remember that there are hundreds of other workers still inside Grand Isle Shipyard currently. There's a current criminal investigation against Grand Isle Shipyard, uh, and hopefully the conditions are changing for the workers as we continue to expose the working conditions. Thank you. So some of the gains that the workers have done, um, they've actually started to organize amongst themselves. They've created an organization in New Orleans, uh, and I was there for the founding in February, called FAST, Filipinos Against Slavery and Trafficking. And they've been engaging in campaigns for trafficked workers, such as nurses and teachers that we saw yesterday with uh, Ms. Ingrid Cruz, uh, with the Filipino teachers in uh, Louisiana. So this case of the GIS workers is an example of why labor and Apollo needs to explore new strategies for organizing and really strengthen our partnerships with community allies. They're, they're, the Grand Isle Shipyard workers are currently under a court-ordered gag order, so we need to be the voice for them. They're not allowed to speak on their case because it's a current in criminal investigation going on. We have to be open and engage in different forms of worker organizing. Community organizations are often at the forefront of social justice issues, and labor should be uniting on campaigns such as comprehensive immigration reform. But we also have to look at these, uh, these legislations critically because comprehensive immigration reform seems to expand guest worker programs in which migrant workers like the ones we saw from the Philippines are continued to be exploited. So these workers, they don't exist in a vacuum. They're part of our communities. Let's strengthen our partnerships with community allies, stand in solidarity to uplift those who are struggling the most, and advance social justice locally and internationally. Thank you. Good job. Okay, so we're, we started this late, so I want to say this group did not get us behind. I'm defending this great panel. But um, if we can take like three questions, um, who has a good question? I'm going to bring the mic to you, because I don't see mics in the room. Oh, you got one mic. So you, you run around on one side and I'll run around on the other. I'm not singing or dancing, as much as I might like to. You uh, got the mic back there. Go yes. ahead, brother. Hi. Uh, um, I'm a labor educator working with uh, IBW Local 3 in New York. And um, we discuss these issues all the time, and especially I'd like to emphasize on the last speaker, because this year in our labor workshop, we are talking about um, international uh, scenarios where workers are being exploited by multinational corporations and they are dying all over the world. And we are trying to connect those tragedies with tragedies that happened in our country before and happening right now. So uh, the last story is particularly powerful, even though all the stories are powerful. Uh, the real challenge is how do we expose these worker exploitations happening either overseas or right here in our country uh, using a new form of uh, information technology or media, because obviously mainstream media, except for a few blips here and there, they're not doing their job. Uh, they're really taking the side of the 1%, the corporations. Okay. So the question is, Got it. do you have any strategy as to how to expose these stories uh, to mainstream America? I'm going to ask Galen, because she actually was quite quick and is quite talented, and you actually are doing this. So yeah, tell, for, say a for little more about how you're using uh, new uh, information technologies, new social network techniques? I think 
Uh, I'm lucky because I'm working with a pool of people who are entertainers, and we tell stories, and we get people to care. You have to get people to care, whether you're, I, we, I work closely with Invisible Children, who did the whole Coney 2012 campaign. The only, are you guys familiar with that, Coney 2012? It's a, they're, they're trying to stop this guy, Joseph Coney, in Africa, who's killing all these, all these kids. So, so they made a, a video that was, uh, I don't remember how long it was. It was, under, it was under 20 minutes. They could have made a full-length documentary about it, but they made a short video that went viral and had millions and millions and millions of views because they got people to care. And it's about sharing your message in the right way. It's about storytelling. You, I might be a storyteller by profession, but no matter what your cause is, you have to get other people to care as much as you care. And just being a talking head and going down a line of facts is not gonna connect people emotionally to what your cause is. So you don't have to use the mainstream media. Now you have YouTube where you can make a three minute video that people will watch, even if it's a 20 second video that drives home whatever it is so that you're sharing what you're feeling, your passion has to translate to the rest of the world. So we have so many outlets now with social media to be able to reach more people than you would even with regular media. You can reach millions and millions of people in an hour if it gets shared properly. That's great, and I think, again, the work you're doing shows that that does work. I just wanted to thank uh, Larry Cohen and this extraordinary panel who are expanding our notion of what the labor movement can and must be. Uh, some of the most exciting work organizing in the country is taking place outside of the official hall of labor. So with the Filipino Worker Center, with APEM, with the Guest Workers Alliance, with ROC, uh, how do we break down the barriers between the official labor movement and how do we uh, expand labor community partnerships to build a more powerful worker justice movement in this country? So Amato, I was really impressed with your story. So if you don't mind taking this one, because again, folks, think about this. All kinds of divisions between Greens, environmentalists, and labor. And it's incredible work that you just heard about, whether it's Chevron and East Bay or other stuff that folks are doing here. So I was really impressed by your work there. And I saw videos from those demonstrations in the last few weeks. So I think you have like the toughest challenge. Why don't you answer Ken's question? Thanks for the, for the question, Ken. I'll try to be brief and then I'd, I'd love to kick it over to Aki as well. The, the two th lessons that I think from, from APEN's perspective is one, we have to scale up, right? Like community-based organizations, I think one of the, the victims, that, uh, one of the things that we fall victim to is, is going to that, you know, the tens or the hundreds of people that are connected to our organization that are true believers. I think Galen spoke to this, like we have to speak to the hearts and minds. And so one of the ways that we tried to do that was really scaling up through our political program, scaling up around, um, you know, not just targeting vo uh, voters in, in Oakland or Richmond, but really looking across the state. Um, legislatively, um, we, we were able to uh, migrate some of the, the political relationships to, to our policy to make sure that cap and trade revenue uh, targeting disadvantaged communities is, is not just an environmental justice concern, but it is a, a concern that, that should be uh, a labor movement concern as well. Um, and building these alliances. Um, in the past, we had some um, misgivings about actually like engaging more in terms of with the traditional uh, labor unions because sometimes we'd have the relationship where we would go and we'd fight for like a campaign like to save Queen of Angels, you know, to to fight. And then, um, w like you said, it was you know a labor with community partners at the table. And then when it's over, that was kind of end of it. So now we're looking at um, also for our organizations, our worker centers, how do we build up scale and how are we building power so that we come to the table and we come mutually, that we are recognized that we are organizing laborers as well and that um, in non-traditional ways, but I think we have so much to learn from each other. We have a lot to learn also from the labor movement, all the experience. Um, you know that that is in this room and uh, labor unions, but also you know, kind of cutting edge. What are we doing to you know reach these workers that you know for so long have thought to be unorganizable? Thank you. One more question. Yes, uh, I wanted to also echo what was already expressed here. Um, that we want to thank you for sharing your stories and sharing the wonderful work you are doing there. Indeed, there are so many workers out there 
that are not currently represented. So we do need to bring up our union density using all of these opportunities to help all of the unions out there to also get those workers organized. So my question actually is this. Um, do you have a current association with some of those unions out there already? For each one of you. And if you have, uh, please let us know. If you haven't, what can we do to get all of our unions to help support you? Thank you. Just because of time, we're going to just have Paul answer that. And then we're going to get people into workshops, right? So you can all get involved. Because we're running late. I'm sorry about that, about the cutoff of questions. But we're running a little bit late here. And I know we want to get to workshops. Paul, you're, in your case, I know in New Orleans, your story, tons of unions involved. Why don't you rattle some of them off and, and talk about how you linked the community, the immigrants, and those unions. OK. So uh, it was really a grassroots effort from the beginning. Uh, these workers, they didn't have a union to go to. There's not a strong union movement in Louisiana, obviously. Um, but there is an organization there called the National Guest Worker Alliance. And they've been our strongest ally in New Orleans. So we've, we've been working with them. Uh, and they have been the ones who are housed, the organizers who are working with these uh, Filipino guest workers. But you know, we do need more partners. We need to expose this issue. Guest workers are being exploited every day all over this country. Uh, this is why Apala needs to take a leadership position and start talking about what's happening in our communities. These folks are coming over from Asia. They're part of the Asian American community now. So we need to stand up and be there for the workers. Um, we have a large representation from all the different unions here today. So we now know about it. So what are we going to do about it? Let's stand up. Let's unite. Let's stand in solidarity with the workers. Good job, Paul. I want to thank the panel. I want to thank Greg and Apollo. And what do we do when we're under attack? What do we do when we're under attack? What do we do when we're under attack? Okay, Greg, thanks. Great to be with you today.